joining us on our Everything ALS bi-monthly webinar where we bring the experts to your living room. My name is Lisa Deegan and I'm part of the Everything ALS team because I lost my younger brother John to ALS in 2018. So I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Hande Osdemler. She has received training in the fields of molecular biology, genetics, cell biology, anatomy, and neuroscience. She is currently an Associate Professor of Neurology at Northwestern University, and her lab focuses on the brain component of ALS. Recently, her group, together with Dr. Silverman, identified the first compound that improves the health of upper motor neurons diseased due to misfolded SOD1 toxicity and TDP43 pathology. In addition to being a scientist, Dr. Osdemler is also an international press member, a writer, and the inventor of Osdeen Art, a new painting style. Dr. Osdemler became interested in neuroscience after losing her brother to stroke at the age of 23. And since then, she's been working relentlessly trying to understand why brain neurons die and how to improve their health. We are excited to have Dr. Osdemler present tonight because in addition to her great work, she is very relatable to the ALS community. She understands those with ALS and caregivers and what they go through. She works tirelessly knowing that there is a time clock. If you were to peek into her office, you would see photos of people with ALS. And when she is tired from working so hard, she told me, she looks at the, at the photos of those affected by ALS and it gives her motivation to keep on working. So with that, I'd like to hand the floor over to Dr. Hande Osdeenler. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Enjoy. Being with you today. So I will be talking about, of course, NU9, but I also want to emphasize why upper motor neurons are important in ALS and other upper motor neuron diseases and how we cannot build effective treatment strategies if we keep ignoring them. And basically, if I make the outline, I'm going to emphasize the fact that the movement starts in the brain and that the brain is an important component in ALS. And the second topic that I would like to emphasize is that we need to improve the health of the neuron, which is the upper motor neuron in this case, to help the circuitry to cure the disease. Because the diseases develop when the circuitries are affected. And the circuitries are made of neurons and astrocytes, macroglia, or other non-neuronal cells. And to keep the circuitry happy, we have to make the neurons and the cells happy. So then everything actually uh, distills down to the health of the vulnerable neuron. Then I'm also going to talk a, li a little bit about how every patient is different. And that our expectation that one drug is going to cure everyone should not be valid anymore. And we have to change our critical thinking to develop effective treatment strategies, basically uh, more patient-oriented and almost personalized medicine approaches so that we can cure everyone, but not, do not expect that one cure will fit all. And then, of course, I'll talk about what do upper motor neurons want and how can we make them happy in our journey identification of NU9 um, as we were trying to find ways to make them happy, how we actually identified NU9 and how we can move forward to expedite discoveries and therapies. As you can see, I have a lot to cover. So sometimes I'm gonna go really fast because those are the published results and our papers are always free and are publicly available. So I'm gonna go fast for the published results. And if I want to make an important point, then I'm gonna slow down a bit. Okay, so as I said, brain is important in ALS. Why? Because there is this motor neuron circuitry which has connections or components both in the brain and the spinal cord. So the brain is actually the executive director of uh, movement. It sends the signal to the spinal cord, to the spinal motor neurons, and then the spinal motor neurons uh, execute function uh, through muscle contraction uh, by uh, th their activities at the neuromuscular junction. But actually the movement starts in the brain. Even before you make a movement, there's activity in the brain. And of course, this is very uh, simple. Organization of motor cir uh, neuron circuitry is of course more complex, but I don't want to give an anatomy lecture, but basically it's the cortex, spinal cord, and ALS 
is the motor neuron circuitry disease, which means both the components of the cortex and spinal cord degenerates. And unfortunately, in the past, it's been always the spinal cord and the muscle and the brain had been left out. And I think we need to bring brain uh, back into the picture. So this is an, a picture or a drawing of an upper motor neuron, a corticospinal motor neuron or a bed cells in patients. You can see how elaborate their uh, structure is. This is their soma cell body. And here, this long extension is called the apical dendrite. So I'm going to repeat it a couple of times during the talk. So it is called apical dendrite. And the axon is the extension that goes all the way to the spinal cord. And you can imagine for a tall person, the length of that uh, uh, axon could be more than 1.5 meter long. And that's a very long axon. And the cell body is about 50 micrometers. And here in the apical dendrite, uh, you will see numerous spines. And spines are the areas where neuronal connections are made. It's like a handshake. So neurons communicate uh, with each other with a small handshake through their spines. And they connect to their spines, they communicate, and they activate each other or they inhibit each other. And at the end of the day, this uh, upper motor neuron receive hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe tens of thousands of uh, inputs through their spines. And it accumulates and uh, distills everything and says, OK, this is an action potential, and starts the action potential from the cortex you know, down to the corticospinal tract, to the midbrain, pons, medulla, and all the way to the spinal cord, and to the ventral horn of the spinal cord, to the corticospinal motor neurons. As you can imagine, this is a very precise uh, path that they have to take. And cord each corticospinal motor neuron project to a distinct area within the spinal cord. So this motor neuron circuitry is all about precision. And uh, its establishment takes postnatally. And once you are born with it, you actually live with it. And that's why it requires high levels of energy. It requires uh, integrity of the cell. So, uh, and then the brain uh, is the uh, critical component for all the movements uh, that we make. And again, here as in the apical dendrites, as I showed you, they have connections both from the local circuitry neurons, but also from the uh, long distance neurons, let's say thalamocortical neurons, colossal projection neurons, and so forth. They all converge onto the apical dendrites. And this is actually an important site for, uh, their, for, for their function. So people believe that brain degeneration is a consequence of the ongoing degeneration and that they are not so important, right? But unfortunately, this is not true. And uh, we now know that the brain raises the red flag very early in the disease, such that the brain hyperexcitation, meaning very active, uh, being very active, is considered an early diagnostic implication for ALS. So ALS patients, even before they show any symptoms, about six months before they show any symptoms, they have cortical hyperexcitation. And then the cortex actually says, there's a problem, there's a problem, much earlier than symptom onset. So uh, building evidence also show, for example, that there are uh, circuitry dysfunctions uh, are the driver, driving force for ALS, and that you can detect some of these by magnetic stimulation uh, and hyperexcitation and so forth. And it is mediated again by changes in the spine. See, these are the little boutons. The, these are the spines in the, uh, uh, at the um, apical dendrite. And that there are ways to detect these uh, hyperexcitability um, in clinics, especially with the magnetic uh, field stimulation tests. So we also found that the electrophysiological components of corticospinal motor neurons begin to emerge really early. This was like P30, P60. Just when they begin to show symptoms, there was cortical uh, dysfunction uh, in the cortex. So that the cortical degeneration is not a late event. It is actually a very early event. And here, these are the apical dendrites. As I told you, those are the extensions of the uh, cells along the PIA. Uh, to the top of the brain. And you can see that these are normal controls. You can, you can even see the little spines here, how beautiful and intact they are. 
And look at this. This is sporadic ALS, familial ALS, FTD ALS. And I'm sure you can see all the vacuoles and how disintegrated they are. They almost become like a ghost. There aren't really any spines left and they fall apart. So when you have an apical dendrite like this, it is very hard for the upper motor neurons to be uh, connected and to actually have a good um, communication with other cortical cells. So uh, we, uh, this was actually coming from a, a paper that we published. So now the question is, if brain is so important and their degeneration is an early event, if we help the brain, would that help the motor neuron circuitry? And the answer is yes. There are actually two very good studies. One of them removed the SOD1 in a rat model of SOD. It not only improved the cortex, it improved spinal motor neurons, neuromuscular junction. So overall, the motor neuron circuitry was improved. Another study by Carolyn uh, showed that uh, using transgenic uh, lines, that if you actually uh, modulate the uh, disease pathology in ALS, it has an impact to the whole motor neuron circuitry. Then, of course, uh, Dr. Brown wrote a very nice review that the, considering ALS, I think we need to think about the uh, cortex as a potential target. So these are all very important and exciting developments that studying brain makes the most uh, sense. So now the first take home message is that brain is important and the brain component or, or the generation of the brain component begins really early. And the brain component is a therapeutic target. So this is, ex this is very important to remember. Now, the second part that I would like to uh, move to is, okay, now that we understand brain is important and we're gonna build therapies, right? Okay. And here on the left-hand side, the top left panel shows how uh, disease progresses in different ALS patients. And you see some of them progress really fast, some slow. So it is actually a very wide uh, distribution of patterns. And it's very hard when you have a pattern like this to, uh, to understand what the uh, you know, disease um, uh, module is or you know, how, how the disease uh, develops. So the beauty is sometimes there are mutations detected uh, uh, you know, in patients and you can make mouse models with those mutations. And if you make a mouse model with uh, a mutation detected in patients, they don't show a, you know, uh, they don't display um, a progression like this, they actually dis display very robust and reproducible um, um, pro uh, projection uh, pattern or uh, yeah, prog uh, disease progression pattern. But the thing is, people have been uh, thinking that if you improve the life of a mouse, you can improve the life of a patient. But unfortunately, mouse is a mouse and human is a human. They are different species and extension of mouse life is not equal to extension of human life. So we expected that the mouse, extent, mouse life extension is equal to human life extension. And this was actually a readout uh, for many of the drug companies, uh, drug discovery uh, platforms, and we failed. Then we started saying, oh, mouse is not good, mouse failed us, and mouse is not a good model. But I think it was our uh, unexpected, or you know, it was our uh, expectation that the mouse would behave like a, a human. The mouse will not behave like a human, but the mouse neuron, the motor neurons, the upper motor neurons in a mouse, is almost identical to the uh, motor neurons, the upper motor neurons in a human. So at a cellular level. The neuron in a mouse and the neuron in a human, the same neuron, are almost identical. So this gives me a chance to uh, you know, remember one of my um, teachers, I would say, uh, Susan Linquist, and I published with her. I'm lucky to, work, to have worked with her. And I want to tell you something. When I started working with her, she told me a story and she said that she started using yeast cells to understand protein folding and neurodegenerative diseases. And people laughed at her and they say, you use yeast? You know, she said, but it is a cell and they have uh, very important uh, similarities with the you know, production of proteins and protein folding. And I'm learning the mechanism. It's not really the organism, it's the cell and it is the mechanism. 
So this is your second home, second take home message. You need to focus your attention to the cell, to the vulnerable neuron. It's not comparing mice to the human, it's comparing cell to the cell. And then we have to learn directly from the cells and the translation is at a cellular level. So we have to understand why the upper motor neurons die, why the spinal motor neurons die. And we have to learn directly from them because the translation is at a cellular level. This brings me to the slide because, you know, <laughs> discoveries don't come easy. This photograph was actually af taken after maybe five years worth of work. And I have screened more than maybe four, 400 genes. And I have found uh, one gene that is expressed in layer five neurons. And they were these were the upper motor neurons. They have high levels of these red dots, if you see. And this was UCHL1. And I have actually made this discovery in uh, Jeff Mathis's lab. And I was also working with uh, Dr. Brown at uh, MGH neurosurgery department when, as a postdoc. So then when I moved to my own lab at Northwestern and I became the director of the second Les Turner ALS laboratory at the time, and I started generating this uh, transgenic mice, which expresses GFP under the control of UCHL1 promoter. Of course, it took us maybe three years to make this mouse, and then maybe another two, three years, uh, two years to characterize it. And this was actually the first reporter line that genetically labels a distinct neuron population, not all neurons in the brain, but the upper motor neurons in the brain. And I'm going to show you just some photographs. Like, look at this. This is layer five. This is P0. P means postnatal. P0 means the day they are born. P800 means these are 800 days old, like two and a half years, and P30 means a month old. And there is no amino in these photographs, and you can see that these are GFP upper motor neurons. So this was actually a very important finding at, at the time because we were able to generate a reporter line for upper motor neurons. So we made them visible. Because people were saying, oh, who cares about the upper motor neurons? You cannot see them. Cortex is very complex. We said, well, look, we made them fluorescent for you. So this was considered a breakthrough at Northwestern at the time. And we also received uh, one of the best 10 uh, innovations of the year award by International Innovation Journal. And this allowed us to visualize and assess upper motor neuron uh, you know, response to treatment. So that was, of course, a, an important finding. An important, most important was that it allowed us to shift our focus from mice to neuron. And then, you know, I was able to listen to Susan Linguist's um, advice so that it's not the mice that we study anymore, it is the neuron. And we were invited to write reviews about this by Drug Discovery because moving forward in clinical trials, we want motor neurons lead the way, please, not, motor, uh, not mouse survival. Then of course, you know, you can, there are many ways that you can give your compound either by injection or by gavage or, you know, many different ways. And of course, their motor cortex is GFP, their spinal motor neurons, uh, some of them are GFP. Then you can see, all right, uh, do, do you have neuroprotection? Do you have better motor function? So there are many, many different ways that we can um, perform drug discovery. And hopefully that's going to be more translational because we will improve the health of the cell. And, but then, you know, what are we going to improve? Like, you know, there are many different um, causes of the disease. Yes, we have upper motor neurons labeled, but uh, which upper motor neuron are we going to use, right? Because there are many different causes for the disease. It's not just one. And it is pos possible that some patients have one mutation, one cause, another patient, another mutation, another cause. And you don't have to have a mutation. It could be sporadic and it could be due to a, a, you know, totally sporadic a, and uh, it's not a mutation related cause, right? But then how are we gonna develop effective treatment strategies if the disease is so heterogeneous? We suggest that we have to include upper motor neurons. And again, we have to focus our attention to the needs of the disease neurons. That's the solution. Then we cross our uh, UEGFP reporter, upper motor neuron reporter, 
to some of the very well characterized disease models that are developed due to the uh, patient mutations so that we actually now have fluorescent upper motor neurons that are diseased due to a given mechanism or due to a, uh, due to a failure uh, of a given mutation uh, or, or an underlying cause. So now we have more than five different uh, lines in our lab, and I think that's the highest in the world. So we have many upper motor neurons that are GFP, and they become diseased due to different underlying cause. Now, because they are GFP, this is the beautiful part. When you put them in tissue culture, all right, when you dissociate cortical cells and put them in tissue culture, there are many other cells in the medium and these GFP neurons, they retain their fluorescence. So you can look in the dish, you know, many cells and exactly you know which one is the upper motor neuron. So this is beautiful because when you add a drug, you just watch them. Then do they like it? Do they not like it? They begin to speak to you. If they like it, they extend an axon, they arborize, they're very happy. If they don't like it, they shrink and they die. So within a couple of days, you can actually do an essay and say, do you like this drug? No, 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 I don't like it. Or do you like it? Oh, I love it. Okay, so then you can screen the ones that they love, the screen the ones that they don't like. And then you can also give them in vivo, then ask if there is degeneration and if they, that, that uh, slows down or stops the degeneration. And again, I want to emphasize here, this will be a cell-based, right? Because we are focusing our attention to the upper motor neurons. This is cell-based and mechanism-focused drug discovery. And this is very novel in the field. Of course, this brings us to a new nine because this is exactly how we identify the new nine. So next, I want, I'm gonna show you a small video because if you watch this video, it's gonna make it easier for me to explain the rest of the, uh, rest of the talk. So the video is about uh, one, one and a half minute long, but uh, please watch it. It's gonna make it easier uh, for the rest of the presentation. Yes, so uh, this was actually published by the uh, publishing group, uh, which uh, our manuscript was um, published. And they also emphasized, if you, I don't know if you paid attention, that this was actually cell-based and mechanism-focused essay. And it also um, emphasizes the pathologies or the problems that are shared amongst species. So I'm gonna dive deep a little bit on this and share some of my thoughts with you. In clinical trials, so what we have currently is because we don't know what the mechanisms are responsible for each patient, especially when it comes to phase three of clinical trials, where we must have a high number of patient population, we include a very large population of patients into the study. But because mechanisms may vary, then the results would vary as well. So some would show an effect and some 
unfortunately no effect and some even have an adverse effect. But if it is possible to you know, move from here to this picture so that we know, for example, patients with blue have are uh, developing the disease due to mechanism one, green is mechanism two. So if we can know the mechanism, then we can actually give them drugs that are more mechanism focused, right? So for example, this drug is more for mitochondrial dysfunction. This drug is for ER uh, uh, stress, for protein aggregation defects, for, for lipid homeostasis, axon transport defects, right? So then actually the chance for us to have more effective outcome increases. I think we have wasted so many phase three trials and some of the uh, drugs and apl uh, applications were actually useful for a subset of populations, but they were deemed insignificant. And then these patients suffer a lot because they actually had very good uh, results. And, but because it was insignificant and because you know, it was failed, they could not continue using it. And I think we need to move from uh, to this new me mechanism-based drug discovery assays. So when I say mechanism-focused or in cell-based, you know, what do I really mean by that? And how can we actually define the problem or define the mechanism in the cell, right? So one way is to look at common pathologies. And, you know, we've been, of course, studying for more than five, six years now, and we realized that in the upper motor neurons, now I'm going to show you some electron microscopy images, and you know, it's, it's not easy to understand these images. So I'll try to uh, guide you a little. This is a mitochondria. And in the mitochondria, you will see some cristae. So these lines are called cristae. And they are important because if you don't have cristae in the mitochondria, you cannot really produce uh, ATP. You need the inner mitochondrial membrane. And here in the ALS patients, look at this mitochondria. They're almost empty inside. So if the mitochondria is like this, this is a problem, which means there is um, energy deficiency, there's mitochondria problems, and this is in the human uh, uh, bed cells. If you look at the SOD1 or the TDP, you also see problems with the mitochondria. They have holes in them, and they are broken cristae and everything. So mitochondrial problem was common between upper motor neurons in the mouse and upper motor neurons in the human, regardless of species. The same was true for endoplasmic reticulum, and that's important for the production of proteins. So in the plasmic reticulum, you see the ribosomes, so they make protein, and look at the patient. It's enlarged, it's swollen, it's broken apart. It's not like the other one, right? Same is true for the SOD1 and TDP. They are broken, and some of them are swollen and so forth, so they, you, they cannot make proper proteins, and they don't have enough energy. So these are very uh, important problems that are shared between two different species. And also I need to emphasize that SOD1 model represents the misfolded SOD1 toxicity, but TDP model is actually a TDP pathology model. So it's very different than the SOD1 model. And it's not really the misfolded SOD1 in this case, but it is the TDP pathology, which is more common than, um, than the SOD1 uh, toxicity. And actually TDP, uh, and actually the uh, mitochondrial defects and ER defects, these are not only observed in the ALS patients, you also see them in the upper motor neurons of heritage spastic paraplegia patients and uh, the impaired mitochondrial dynamics uh, also underlie the axonal defects. S so what, this is a nice review by Dr. Uh, Blackstone, Greg Blackstone, so that uh, telling us that the mitochondria and ER are also common pathologies for HSP patients. So then when we uh, look for mechanism, I don't think it's just going to be for ALS patients, but also heritage spastic paraplegia patients and even PLS patients are going to benefit from those. So when we built the drug discovery platform, both the in vitro and the in vivo, at, in the same, at the same time, you know, in different campuses, in different domains, Dr. Silverman was developing a compound, NU9, from compound one, going to compound two, and then NU9. And he showed already that this NU9 reduces SOD1, misfolded SOD1 in different cell lines. 
So we met one of the uh, ALS symposiums and we and he said, you know, I have a compound, I have multiple compounds, which actually reduces the SOD1 toxicity. And I said, oh, I have the SOD1 uh, reporter line and I can see the upper motor neurons, let's start working. And we started in tissue culture and then we uh, worked with um, mouse models. And I'm gonna tell you today, uh, what we have been working on for the past five, six years. And here's a table for the pharmacokinetic properties of NU9. It's actually pretty good because it crosses the blood brain barrier. It does not show toxicity in mice. We have not done it in large animals, but um, bioavailability is pretty good. So it has uh, drug like properties, that's what they call. And we have uh, started an experimental procedure where we give NU9 uh, gavage. The reason we started giving gavage is because we were also thinking about patients with PEG so that, you know, even if people cannot swallow, right, because if this is an upper motor neuron disease, you know, bulbar onset patients lose their ability to swallow early, we said maybe we can actually give it by oral gavage so that, you know, uh, even patients with PEG uh, may use it uh, in, in clinical trials. So we developed a uh, Gavage at uh, giving gavage at P60. P60 meanings meaning 60 day old. That's uh, two months, and we gave a new nine for two months, 60 days, and we stopped the experiment at P120. We gave two doses, 20 milligrams per kilogram day and 100 milligram per kilogram per day, and I can tell you that even at 100 milligram per day for 60 days. We did not see any toxicity, any abnormality in any of the organs, any unexpected deaths, nothing at uh, P120. So it was very well tolerated, even at this very uh, high dose, 100 milligram per day. Now, remember, we were talking about mechanism uh, focused uh, drug discovery, right? And then we identified two mechanisms, mitochondria and ER. Then, of course, the first question we ask when we give a new nine, does the mitochondrial health improve, right? Because if NU9 is a mechanism-based drug, it should improve also the integrity of mitochondria. And you would see that in the vehicle, meaning like there was nothing given or it was just like a, a empty um, treatment. Mitochondria is, some of them are like uh, empty and some, some are dead and here is your lysosome that they're going to be cleared later on and you know mitochondria does not look healthy again ER does not look healthy and look at here with a new nine treatment you have numerous healthy mitochondria you even have a very intact ER it was almost like wild type and of course because we are doing those uh, experiments blindly we said, where is it treated? Where is it treated? <laughs> because we thought we were all counting the wild types. There was no treated group. Then we unblinded ourselves and we realized, wow, the treated is like the wild type. And it was indeed like the wild type because the mitochondria integrity was amazing. And the uh, ER also uh, were very healthy. They were very similar to the wild type levels. So 60 day treatment, 60 day treatment of NU9 was able to you know, make these uh, unhealthy mitochondria healthy as well type. And of course, if your mitochondria is improved, if your ER is improved, guess what? There is less protein aggregation in the uh, upper motor neurons in the SOD1. The aggregation levels drop uh, with respect to the um, high doses of uh, NU9. So we were also able to reduce the misfolded SOD1 in the upper motor neuron. So these are all very good, right? So we are trying to give a re relief to the upper motor neurons that are vulnerable to degeneration. And then we said, okay, how about the apical dendrite? You remember I told you that the apical dendrites are very important if they are vacuolated, if they are falling apart, that's not good. And in the wild type, we realized that, um, that you know they are pretty healthy but in the disease, look at this, they are all falling apart. You don't almost, you, 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 you hardly see anything left. And with 100 milligrams per kilogram, look at this, how beautiful, beautiful they were. Then we uh, you know, quantified them. And yes, with 100 uh, milligram per kilogram, they were very close to the wild type level. 
And then we have given NU9 to the wild type mice as well. So this was important to see if NU9 is toxic, because if it is toxic, when you give it to wild type, you begin to see degeneration, right? And we didn't. So giving uh, NU9 to wild type did not do any harm. Actually, it improved a bit, you know, and we don't think NU9 is toxic to uh, the wild type, even at the 100 milligram per kilogram dose. So this was all very good news. And how about the cell counts? So can we really retain these degenerating neurons in the motor cortex? Because if you look in the wild type, look, these are beautiful layer five neurons. They are large. They have beautiful apical dendrites. And look at the SOD1, almost nothing left. Like you, you, even the ones that are you see are, they don't have apical dendrites, they're degenerating. This is striking contrast to each other, right? And if you give NU9, ta-ta, it improves. And it is such that, you know, it's, it, it's almost like comparable to wild type levels. So normally this mice, this brain should have looked like this. If we didn't treat, it should have looked like this. But because we started treating at P60, the neurons that degenerate, they did not degenerate. They stayed in the cortex and they, they look pretty healthy as I showed you with the apical dendrites and so forth. So we stopped their degeneration. They stopped degenerating and they are retained in the cortex and even 60 day treatment uh, makes them uh, similar to wild type levels. And again, quantification, every dot is one mouse. So one, two, three, four, five, six, nine. Mice. So it's not just two, three mice. We have done it extensively. And yes, even giving a new nine, 100 milligram per kilogram, very similar to wild type cases. That was remarkable. That's the best that we have seen so far. And we were very, very excited about these results. And again, it improves the integrity of mitochondria ER, reduces protein aggregation, and helps improve the cytoarchitectural stability, especially at the site of apical dendrites. And this happens in the upper motor neurons that die due to SOD1 toxicity. But then, see, TDP pathology uh, is broadly observed, right, in ALS, in ALS FTLD, inherited spastic paraplegia as well, and even in primary lateral sclerosis. And uh, the TDP goes from nucleus to the cytoplasm, it starts accumulating. And again, in the TDP um, mouse, you see mitochondrial defects, you see ER defects, and in the uh, motor neurons, upper motor neurons of patients with TDP pathology, you see mitochondrial defects, you see ER defects. See, our hypothesis was that if this is mechanism-based drug discovery, and if NU9 works on a mechanism, right? And if ER and mitochondria are the common or the converging mechanisms, even though NU9 was discovered due to uh, misfolded SOD1 toxicity, it should also work for TDP pathology. See, we had no data uh, to suggest that it does, only the assumption that NU9 should improve the health of mitochondria in ER, and if so, it should also help TDP pathology, uh, upper motor neurons that are diseased with TDP pathology. So we started the experiment. And before we uh, start the experiment, I want to tell you that in the, uh, in the TDP pathology, we already showed we made the mouse, of course, first we made the mouse, and we all already showed that patients with TDP pathology, again, have C, uh, mitochondrial defects, empty mitochondrias everywhere, and they have ER defects. Look at these ER. This is normally the ER, and in the patient, these are in the bed cells. These are electron microscopy images of bed cells of patients, ALS patients, with TDP pathology. So we know that we are dealing with the same problem. And I'm going to go fast now. Yes, we definitely see, look at this, the mitochondria becomes from here to here. ER becomes like this, uh, from, starts from this and becomes like this. So even with 60-day treatment, the mitochondria becomes very healthy 
and ER becomes very healthy. And this is a totally different disease and totally different pathology. And yet NU9 uh, crosses the borders and works in TDP pathology as well. And it does improve the integrity of the apical dendrite. And it does also improve and uh, the health of the corticospinal motor neurons and stops their degeneration and help them retain in the cortex in the most healthy fashion. So this was actually very important because in two different disease models and two representing two different underlying causes of the disease, NU9 works really well. Then of course, question is, how about the spinal motor neurons, right? Because in ALS, we have to cure the spinal motor neurons as well. And let me tell you, the spinal motor neurons, especially in the SOD1 mice, did not respond well to NU9. It's not as good as the upper motor neurons. And we did not see uh, you know, retention of spinal motor neurons. They still underwent uh, progressive degeneration. And NU9 was not able to support the survival of the spinal motor neurons. So now, this is actually uh, another uh, take on point coming up because it's all always our expectation, right? That whatever works for spinal motor neurons should also work for upper motor neurons, right? Maybe we should not expect that upper motor neurons and spinal motor neurons are the same because they are not. They're actually born to, uh, from different neural progenitors. They develop differently. They mature differently. They are one in the cortex. The other one is in the spinal cord. They have very totally different uh, gene expression profiles. One of them expressed, for example, CTIP2, does, the, the other doesn't. One of them expressed CHAT, the other one doesn't. They have different growth factor requirements. They have different targets. But it is our expectation that whatever works for spinal motor neurons Ah, should work for upper motor neurons, right? And that's why they have never investigated the health of the upper motor neurons in any of the preclinical essays. So they thought like whatever works for spinal motor neurons should work for upper motor neurons. But NU9 shows that we should treat them maybe differently and that they may have different requirements. And I think for building effective treatment strategies, we need to consider both the upper and the lower motor neurons for their health. And NU9 is the first compound that improves the health of disease upper motor neurons. And I think this would be very important, especially for HSP and PLS patients, because we have shown that TDP pathology is important for them. Mitochondria and ER is also important for the health of the upper motor neurons in both HSP and PLS patients. And this would be a, a good candidate to improve the health of their degenerating upper motor neurons. And for ALS patients, of course, it would definitely help the improvement of the motor neuron circuitry. Maybe in combination with other compounds, we would have long-term and effective treatment strategies because just leaving the cortex out will not help us uh, develop uh, long-term and uh, effective solutions. And hopefully NU9 will be the missing piece in that puzzle. And in summary, I can say, please do not forget the brain. Let's identify drugs that will work in humans. And to identify drugs that will work in humans, we have to focus our attention to the motor neurons, to the neurons in need. And we have to make neurons happy, uh, to make patients happy. And NU9 is the first compound for diseased upper motor neurons. And for, the, uh, for any work, uh, as extensive as this. Of course, it can't be done alone. It can't be done uh, without support. We have received extensive support uh, from numerous foundations, first with Les Turner ALS Foundation, Brain Research Foundation, ALS Association, Spastic Paraplegia Foundation. We, rec we recently received a grant with them. And of course, we received uh, NIH and NIA grants. And recently I became the scientific director of AlongSwim uh, who support our collaborative efforts in ALS and I'm very thankful to them. Um, most importantly, of course, people in our lab, it's been a, a ever growing lab, very enthusiastic people. And I don't have pictures of everyone here, but I'm indebted to them, to their passion, to their hard work and whatever um, 
we discover in the lab it's uh, all with tears and joy and long hours and uh, it's all thanks to people in the lab and I'm very thankful to them. So I am also very thankful to you. And I think if what I say resonates with you, it's merely because we are both branches on the same tree. And at the end of the day, you know, we're trying to find a cure for ALS. Well, when we find a cure for ALS, I think we will also be finding a cure for uh, other neurodegenerative diseases because neurodegeneration by itself, I think is the trunk of this tree. It's one uh, big uh, problem. And each branch may represent a different aspect of neurodegeneration, maybe vulnerability of a different neuron population or degeneration of a distinct circuitry and thus a different disease, but they all go back to the trunk of the tree. And if we then uh, focus our attention to the cells that degenerate, to the neurons that degenerate and why they degenerate. And we go uh, do a root cause analysis and find the cause and we develop treatments for that cause, then we may be actually helping not only multiple branches, but the whole three. And that's our goal uh, in an effort to um, and the um, ALS and other neurodegenerative diseases. And I'm gonna stop here so that we will have some time for talks, uh, for questions. And I'm very thankful for, uh, for inviting me. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. I can tell just in the chat alone, people were very excited to be able to understand. They truly say that they were able to follow and be engaged and it was, filled with information that was useful and so much that I, I'm just really grateful. Thank you so much. That was very helpful. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm a Everything ALS team member and myself along with uh, James will be moderating some questions that uh, people have put in the chat or sent to us prior. So we do have a few um, to get through. To start us off, uh, during your presentation, you spoke about cortical dysfunctions and how they kind of showed up prior to um, disease presenting itself. Is there any tests available for the presence of this cortical dysfunction that people can kind of monitor throughout? Uh, so, you know, this TMS, uh, hyper, cortical hyperexcitability test is done, but I don't think people just by themselves go and say, oh, let me have this cortical hyperexcitable test is done, right? It's usually done for spinal cord injury patients or, you know, if there is really a need uh, in the cortex. And it's, I, I don't know uh, if there's really a place where people would just walk in and have their cortical um, hyperexcitation tested. To follow up, is it something that they should be getting tested once they have seen symptoms of um, maybe ALS? Excuse me? Is it a test that should be maybe administered if patients are questioning some kind of neurodegenerative disease? Uh, yes. So, for example, our colleagues in Australia, uh, they performed this test to, um, you know, familial ALS patients. Let's say they know they have the mutation, uh, but they haven't shown any symptoms, but they determine, you know, uh, how long before they develop the symptom, their cortex actually will uh, give a red flag. So, especially for familial ALS uh, cases that you know you have the mutation and you're going to develop the disease, I think there there is a way that uh, th that is done uh, in in clinics around that topic. Wonderful, thank you. Hi, I'm James. Thank you for joining us, Doctor. To continue off on the questions uh, specifically with the cortical dysfunctions. Um, what are some of the ways uh, that you have seen that the cortical dysfunctions present themselves and what should uh, people be on the lookout for, specifically for those patients who do not have a familial form of ALS? I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this because I don't see patients in clinic. I'm a researcher. I do research. And uh, I would not like to you know, say something and I don't want it to be wrong. I mean, I have some suggestions, but I don't want, I want to keep it to myself because I don't want to say it's wrong. Absolutely. Um, in regards to the breakdown of the mitochondrial membrane and endoplasmic reticulum, were both sporadic ALS and familial ALS patients observed um, or are they planning on to both be observed? And if so, 
Did you notice any results? Or I know the testing was done in the SOD1 trial, so. Yes, so that is the most interesting thing. Even though patients are familial or uh, sporadic or regardless of which mutation they have, the problem is the same. So that's very interesting, right? Because the breaking down of the inner mitochondria membrane, we observe in FTD, ALS patients, ALS patients, familial ALS, sporadic ALS, and ER problems, we also observe in a broad spectrum of ALS patients. And you know, Dr. Blackstone's work also shows that they are also in HSP patients and PLS patients. It's not just ALS. So we think that uh, degenerating upper motor neurons, one of the major problems that they have is again, not being able to maybe um, have enough energy. And also mitochondria is not just energy, you know, uh, it is an important site for lipid uh, breakdown. Can you imagine? Because they do beta oxidation of lipid to generate energy. If the inner membrane is broken, so then they break the lipids to generate energy. But then for mitochondria to replace electron cycle, the, you know, the, uh, to generate energy with lipid, then the, the motor neurons require tons of lipids to generate enough uh, energy, right? So this may be one of the reasons why the ER membrane is so enlarged because ER membrane is one of the sites for lipid production. And ER membrane and uh, mitochondria are always in close contact. So those sites are called MUM. So they are very important for lipid homeostasis. And we find now that for the upper motor neurons, the lipid homeostasis is, is, is extremely important because the mitochondria ER interaction are extremely important also for lipid homeostasis. So that's another topic coming up. And I think we will have another drug for uh, modulating lipid homeostasis and that's gonna improve the health of upper motor neurons too. So NU9 hopefully is the first compound but we will have multiple coming up too. I, I personally found the whole mitochondria endoplasmic reticulum portion fascinating. Um, to continue with that notion, are there any existing drugs or supplements on the market that improve the survival of the mitochondria in the endoplasmic ventriculum from breaking down? So as far as I know, Emilix compound that is used in uh, platform trials, it's a combination of two drugs and they should be working uh, in um, mitochondria and ER, they improve, but I don't know what is the mechanism. Do, do they really improve the inner mi mitochondria? I, I know that they improve the health of mitochondria and we have actually tested them in, in tissue culture in vitro uh, together with uh, NU9 and or individually and so forth. I think NU9 is better. So we haven't published it yet, but we still have to do a couple more experiments to see um, you know, if combinatorial uh, um, will have a better impact. But NU9 also reduces protein aggregation and NU9 also improves the cytoarchitectural dynamics. So it's actually one stone, four birds. Wow. It's a pretty hefty stone. <laughs> a boulder. <laughs> pretty much. Um, what was the results after uh, the 60 days that passed for the mice that you gave the NU9? Did dendrites show any kind of um, atrophy or continue to regress or did they continue to survive after that 60 days? So uh, because we did not do survival assay at P120, we stopped the experiment. And at that time, when we stopped the experiment, we realized that when we give NU9, there's, there's no degeneration. So they look very similar uh, to the wild type cases. So um, that was actually very remarkable. And again, these experiments were done blindly, like the person who gave the compound versus the person who perfused versus the person who took the images, person who counted, they're all different. And then one of them, A, B, C, the other one is one, two, three, you know, and then it was this moment of truth. We break the code, we do the statistics, and that was, that was a remarkable day. Absolutely. Uh, one of the big questions, um, when will the phase trials for NU9 be expected to start and how many are you anticipating would be participating in the trial? 
Oh, so maybe I can share my slides again because I thought that people would ask me, what is the next step? <laughs> How are we going to That's move forward? That's one of the questions, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, maybe I can, so maybe I can share my screen again, if you don't mind. Is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah, go for it. Okay, it's because many people ask me, you know, okay, this is a great finding, but when will I have a new nine, right? Because we, 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 we show um, good results at this cellular level and in two different mouse models, but then uh, patients are... Um, you know, eager to uh, have treatments or new treatments. And let me sh show you this picture. This is a very unfortunate picture. And this is actually a picture of a failure because when you do basic research and then you do drug discovery and then you do preclinical, you have many, 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 many compounds, right? And then from this preclinical, you jump into clinical and then the, this is the uh, the IND submission to FDA, then you start phase one. But most fail in phase one, then you come to phase two, and you most fail in phase three, and you come to phase three, and almost everything fails in phase three. And if you're lucky, you just have one approved medicine. Two, I don't know, maybe thousands of compounds or molecules tested, right? So this is like a leak hose. It's as if like there's leakage in every step. And to get an one FDA approved medicine, you basically lose so many potentially good ones along the way. And I think this picture will, and I mean, it, it has to change over the years. And the way that it is going to change, I think is, uh, is because this picture, when it was, you know, uh, generated, none of the uh, preclinical essays were cell-based or mechanism-focused, or in a, or in the upper motor neurons, I should say, right? So no one actually looked at the upper motor neurons. There's not a single, can you imagine, not a single preclinical essay for the health of upper motor neurons, even for the diseases of the upper motor neurons. None. So they move into clinical trial with the assumption that it's going to work in the upper motor neurons. So then, you know, not, there's not enough testing here. So we are going to fulfill this uh, column. And then we don't have good biomarkers or outcome measures. Let's say you give it compound, right? How will you know that the compound is working or not? So we have ALS FRS score, but it's very hard to know if the uh, upper motor neurons or spinal motor neurons, uh, their integrity, their health, their connectivity uh, is retained and they're happy, they're healthy and so forth, right? And then there's really not, not much uh, to trace the ongoing progression or uh, you know, how disease improves. So it's as if like you're throwing a stone to the darkness and you expect that it's going to work or not work, or you have these very vague definitions and you, based on those definitions, you say, this is working, this is not working. And phase three is a big hell because you add apples, oranges, everything together, right? It's like a jambalaya. And then you expect one drug or one compound to make everyone happy or you know, re re remove or reduce the uh, problem for everyone. So this is all, almost like a miracle. It's, it's just like, it, it's unfounded expectations. So it's not that it never works. And most of the compounds actually work in many patients, but it's our unfounded expectation that it's gonna work for everyone. Maybe we should change that and say, for example, you know, we're gonna apply this compound and I don't know if my next slide is this, exactly. We're gonna apply this compound for this patient population. We're not gonna include everyone, but we're gonna include basically people with TDP pathology or people who have problems with lipid homeostasis or with cytoskeleton dynamic defects or with oxidative stress, ER stress and so forth and develop uh, drugs based on these mechanisms and do more targeted uh, phase two and phase three, 
So then whatever comes to phase two, phase three, I think we're, not, we're gonna have more than one drug approved. So I think we also learn from our failures now. Uh, and in the near future, this picture I think is gonna change. So now with um, the NEILS uh, consortium also allows multiple compounds to move in parallel. That's also a game changer because it's not just one arrow, you now you're approaching with multiple lines, right? And this is also good because if it is multiple lines, you have less placebo. You don't have to have many patients taking the placebo. You can actually improve the, uh, uh, the power analysis, use more patients for uh, mechanism focused uh, drug discovery. And I, that is what is happening. And I think within like a, a very short period of time, it won't be just this drug or we found one drug. It will be that we found multiple drugs and which one is good for you? So that will be the question. It will be the matchmaking question. Like we have, uh, we have drugs for mitochondria, we have drugs for ER, we have drugs for cytoskeleton, we have drugs for... Which one would be best for you? Then those biomarkers would be exceptionally important for the matchmaking. Oh, this patient actually has problems with this, 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 this. Therefore, we think uh, uh, a treatment of ABC would be best for them. And then the other patient has, oh, this, 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 and a treatment with you know, YZF would be good for them. So I think we are moving more into uh, more personalized medicine approaches. And that would be the solution uh, for the future. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense for us to fit into this picture. This picture will have to change. And changing that picture, changing this picture, or not changing, but improving this picture, I think is uh, the uh, is the way uh, is the way forward. And I, you know, of course, many people have written about this, and I have also written an uh, opinion article about how, for example, rules in FDA are also changing. For example, they never allow off-label use or expanded access or compassionate use. So these reduce the burden that we have on phase three, right? If you know that it is not toxic and if you know the mechanism, mode of action, if you know the target. So maybe a patient um, can use the drug even though the, the drug has not completed uh, phase three clinical trials. So there is some loosening of the FDA rules and regulations and some drugs are available, but just because they're available does not mean it is present, right? For example, they may say this drug is available to you, but that doesn't mean you can come, come and get it tomorrow, right? And the availability becomes presence. And I think this is also uh, going to happen in the future that uh, drugs that are available uh, will, be made, um, will be made available to patients. And um, this would facilitate, uh, you know, the, uh, the drug discovery. So for the NU9, they keep asking us, you know, where are you in the game? Where are you in the game? So we have done, of course, the in vitro studies, in vivo studies, we identified the compounds, we have results. But now, before you go to uh, FDA, you have to prove that this compound is not toxic in large animals, okay? So we have done in the mouse, but that's not good enough. We might be done in the mice or, or rats, or this is not good enough. You have to work either like dogs or pigs or monkeys, like it needs to be a large animal, large mammal, that it is not toxic. It's different doses, it's not toxic. That is a must. So toxicity study is a must. Then Dr. Silverman has to produce high quantities, like kilograms, you know, I don't know, 100 kilograms, so much and high quality because the NU9 that you give to the mice cannot be the same NU9 to you give to a human, right? It needs to be perfect and it needs to be pure, pure, pure and production of such high quality and high amount of NU9, of course, require facilities, <coughs> of course, requires a lot of time, money and everything. The good news is Dr. Silverman actually formed the company you know, Akaba Therapeutics. And uh, he is now, uh, you know, within the company, he's now, uh, you know, starting the toxicology studies or meeting with FDA to see what they are required for the toxicology studies. <coughs> and 
uh, we are in that step. So we are in this step before going to FDA, pre performing all the toxicology studies and producing large amounts. In the meantime, in my lab, I'm all, this was just like the first discovery, right? ONU9 does this. But of course, many questions arise. What is the mechanism of action? How does it do this? Like you tell me it improves the integrity of mitochondrial membrane, how? And uh, what, it, does it have any combinatorial effects with other drugs? Does it work with better with this, better with that? And so of course we do uh, mechanism of action and combinatorial effects with other uh, drugs. So more experimental uh, approaches in our lab while Dr. Silverman is trying to rush this and push this forward as fast as possible. And uh, so then our goal would be to initiate phase one clinical trial, mo moving into phase two. And after we complete phase two, and you know, we gave a promise that uh, we will actually make this compound available uh, you know, to patients through uh, accessible access or um, you know, compassionate use. And we, we are not here to make profit. We are actually here to help patients as much as possible. So we are, we are in this step now. And uh, people always ask, you know, how do we help? How do we help? Uh, please help Dr. Silverman to mush, push this forward with uh, FDA. And um, I'm, I'm already receiving help from donors and foundations. And if you want to support them, great. And uh, we are working as, as, as hard as possible uh, in the lab to understand the mechanism of action so that you know, we can actually increase the or decrease the gap from the preclinical to the phase one. And I believe if we, you know, uh, when we get uh, toxicity studies are the phase one and phase two would be um, much uh, effective and efficient because um, there are numerous developments in the field, especially for ALS. And now with NU9, hopefully we will be able to include HSP, PLS, and upper motor neuron diseases into the clinical trials as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing too. I, I spoke too much. <laughs> no, that was, I, I think that was gold. I think that answered a lot of questions and a lot of frustrations we have with why is it taking so long and to visually see the process, I think that's very helpful, uh, for, at least for me, I think. Yes, so we, I can't blame FDA, FDA because FDA ensures that nothing is toxic that goes into the patients, right? So they don't really care of the current patient. They're talking about the global toxicity that it must not be toxic. And uh, they don't care if your uncle is sick today. They don't care if you are sick tomorrow. They're, they're because with the, the decisions that may, they make is for long-term. And, but then to expedite this thing and you know, to make sure that this actually moves really fast because we know it can move fast, right? This is what happened with COVID, like boom, boom, boom. So it can move fast. And uh, I am on, on the same boat with you. I mean, I also don't have much time. I, I don't think so. Let's get this um, to the clinic as early as possible. And that's why communities like this are important because we will be the driving force to raise awareness and make sure that people get in, engaged. And um, even like five years ago, we didn't have expanded access. We didn't have compassionate use. We didn't have off-label use. We didn't have platform trials. I think the uh, development is very fast, but for some people it may not be fast enough. And, uh, but it is in our hands, I think, to expedite it as much as possible. And I, as a scientist, I'm trying to do my best in the lab uh, with my research, with my discoveries, and um, and I'm happy that NU9 actually appeared to be working really well for the SOD1 and the TDP pathology. Well, that was wonderful. Um, I think all of this happens, I mean, I'm just kind of speechless a little bit, which is very rare for me because of all the information that we got and just how well presented. So thank you so much. Um, on that note, with all that information, we are going to um, kind of go to our open forum section next, but we want to first and foremost, thank you so much for coming and joining us today. I know we will definitely be working together in the future and um, because we're, we're back in every every sentence that was said, that's exactly how we feel at everything ALS too. So anything we can do to help your research with NU9, you know, please let us know. Um, 
for everyone. This will be the time of the day where we get to uh, see how everybody's doing and let McFinn kind of run the show. So um, we will uh, I'll let you unmute yourselves and, and talk and feel free to stay if you'd like to, um, but don't feel, I know we want to respect your time. So don't feel like uh, you have to stay there. Girl. Do you mind if I say a few words just before Absolutely. we leave? Yes, for so sure. So thank you so much again for inviting me. And this is a very uh, engaged group. And uh, our goal is to, uh, you know, to see an end uh, to rare diseases, to ALS, to HSV, to PLS. And I think patients have suffered a lot already. And uh, if, if we can move this NU9 into clinic as, as quick as possible, that's our goal. And I think these are the times that we should join our efforts so that we see an end uh, to these horrible diseases. And I'm very happy to be with you tonight. Thank you for the invitation and have a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hande. Uh, we really appreciate it. We had over 270 people, 70 sessions. I would say pro probably about 400 people who listened to you today. And uh, thank you. There was a lot of interest in what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, we had an awesome turnout. And again, everybody, we're gonna have this recorded. So if you wanna watch it again, because it was so amazing, you can do that. And then those who missed it, so subscribe to our um, YouTube channel so you can get all the latest and greatest videos that we have and follow us on social media. I posted it in the, in the chat. Thank you.